Welcome to Vasm Assembly episode 7. I usually record the podcast from the comfort of my home office, but today I'm in an actual studio. And with me is no other than the one and only Thomas Naderstad, product manager on the Google Chrome team. Um, we have actually three Thomases on <laughs> the Vasm team here. We have you, we have Thomas Lively, and there's me. You prefer Thomas, I usually go by Tom. But what about the third Thomas? We need yeah, another no. name for the third Thomas. Well, anyways, welcome to Vasm Assembly, Thomas. Thank you, Tom. Really great to be here. Glad to have you. So most product managers, PMs for short, um, that I know work on something that is concrete that you can sort of touch, like Google Maps, Gmail, whatever, like a product, Google Photos, that has a UI. But you work on a product that is you know, a thing, but you can't really touch it, you can't really see it. So how is it to work with a team on something that doesn't have a visible user interface? Yeah, it's a really good question. And as a product manager, you're usually working on things with UI or things that people usually think of as products, like end user products. Obviously, Chrome is a product, but, uh, you know, despite working on Chrome, you know, my core focus is WebAssembly and some of these other web APIs that are, if anything, just like programmer tools and technologies that people use to build websites. And so my users really are developers themselves uh, who use these technologies. And I'm actually really enjoying not having any UI uh, to care about. I am one of those weird PMs who just doesn't really care where buttons go, but I really love figuring out how to empower and enable developers to create amazing things. And it's also fun getting to be a little bit more technical and actually, you know, reconnecting with my engineering roots. Mm -hmm. So looking at Chrome, um, it has a very long history of WebAssembly. What has, what has been Chrome's strategy? What, what is the reason even for investing in something like WebAssembly as a browser team? Yeah, it's a really good question. And uh, again, as a PM for something that doesn't have a, any UI, I end up doing a lot of strategy and ecosystem understanding. You know, like Chrome is a product that we give away for free and even open source, and we invest a lot into things like WebAssembly. So a big part of my job is figuring out that strategy and making it make sense. And yeah, I've been on the team seven years now and have really gotten to see WebAssembly evolve significantly and our strategy along with it. Uh, in the early days, it was a lot of focus on these like big, powerful apps. We had folks like AutoCAD, who was one of the trailblazers, uh, shipping on WebAssembly early. We had Google Earth, which was previously running on a similar but Chrome-only technology called uh, Pinnacle, or Knackle. And uh, we saw WebAssembly as a really critical opportunity to empower those big apps and like really impressive, heavy experiences. And that was a great experience to product manage also because uh, I got to work with these amazing developers like um, Photoshop and AutoCAD and really deeply understand what they needed from the web platform in order to find success. And that was actually the impetus for us going off and starting the Fugu Capabilities Project to expand to APIs like File System Access and many others, which we also worked together on. It was a great experience. And also things like bringing uh, PWAs to desktop and really just fleshing out that full big app experience. Uh, more recently, we've been focusing on uh, more than just C++ cross-platform applications, really with a heavy focus on Kotlin and the Android ecosystem, as well as uh, Swift from the iOS ecosystem, and of course, uh, also Dart and Flutter. And so enabling these kind of cross-platform apps where you're also exporting the same code base you know, to your Android app, um, just as your web app. And then, of course, there's AI. WebAssembly is a big enabler of AI. I can't go without mentioning that on a Google podcast. And uh, then there are also libraries that we're really excited about activating. One of our kind of hypotheses is that not every web developer wants to use Emscripten for their projects or have C++ expertise. But we want to bring the power of WebAssembly to all these web developers, which we expect to happen through libraries that people traditionally will just take off NPM. And so we're working through things like bundler integration and a lot of other pieces to make that work really well to empower these web developers with more capable libraries and more performant libraries. So before we go into any of these topics any deeper, I want to just go back to the very beginning. Um, Google Earth, I think, was the first yeah. ever big application that Google at least brought to the web. Um, do you remember how much of a risky enter, uh, undertaking was that? Um, like, what was the failure rate that the team were like, <laughs> oh, this is only 8% likely to succeed or something? Was there something like that? Like, was there, was there failure part of the plan? 
It's a it's a good question. Um, Google Earth had always wanted to be on the web. Um, you know, I actually don't even remember it as a native application, but I realized I was using it as a native app when I was using it. Uh, so they always wanted to be in the browser, and that's why they picked this uh, Pinnacle technology. And so they actually did build a version of that. So there was a version available in the browser, and our plan was to deprecate Pinnacle and move it over to Wasm. And so. I don't think there was ever so much of a big question of whether or not they were going to be able to make it at all. It, I think it was more of a matter of like timelines and figuring out when we'd actually be able to turn down Pinnacle, which we have by now. Yeah, we talked about this a little bit with uh, Alan Zakai back back then. Um, yeah, Pinnacle definitely was one of the trailblazers for WebAssembly, and I'm glad that um, eventually we managed to bring uh, a product like Google Earth onto the web. I remember downloading the uh, the Axie for Windows when uh, Google, uh, yeah, I don't know when it was, like a couple of years uh, before that effort um, to bring it to the web when Google acquired that company. And um, mm -hmm. it was like, oh my God, this is an amazing software. But yeah, how much better is it today that we can just uh, go to the web and um, go anywhere on the planet with this amazing, um, yeah, images that they have of everything essentially. You can go back and uh, yeah, like it's amazing software. Yeah. Um, so I dug deep into the archives, and um, one of the first things that I found about you about WebAssembly was your Blink on talk from Blink on Nine, which was in May two thousand and eighteen, <laughs> which was yeah quite some time ago. And in it, you already were the product manager of WebAssembly, um, and yeah, as I said, we worked together for quite some time <laughs> now. But um, I don't really know the history of you, how you got into it, because you were there when I joined, so. I was wondering, like, how does one become the PM of WebAssembly? What, like, what brought you there? Yeah, it's it's a really good question. Um, so I started obviously as an engineer in college and got my you know CS degree and kind of start started getting interested in product management, but was still really torn between being a software engineer and being a uh, product manager. And then I joined the Google APM program, which I can highly recommend. It's a really great program for like fresh out of college. Um, Engineers. So a APM is Associate Program yeah. Manager? Okay. Yeah, sorry, that's Associate Product Manager. Great program that I came through. And there's a rotation process um, where uh, you get matched after one year on the program with a new team. And Chrome was one of those options. And I had actually met Alex Komorowski, who was a group product manager for Chrome for a while. Uh, and he's just an incredible person. And I went there specifically to work with him. And uh, then after six months, he left. Um, uh, because along, of you? No, for, I hope not. <laughs> uh, he had some other great opportunities to try to tackle, but we also lost a lot of other PMs. And so uh, WebAssembly was the thing that I originally came to Chrome to work on. Um, and actually, I had this vision of Chrome as being like, you know, like probably had like 50 to 100 product managers working on all this stuff. Uh, and then after I had actually been like, yes, I'm going to work on WebAssembly, they were like, oh, also you'll be the PM for like JavaScript and V8. And I'm like, you're telling me they don't have like three product managers already, and they're like, no, no, there's no one. Like you'll 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 be doing it. I'm like wow, okay. Um, but yeah, what was your startup project? My startup project, I think, was probably a Chrome Dev Summit 2017. It must have been um, where I gave a conference talk on JavaScript, V8, performance. And that was like six weeks after I had just joined the team or something like that. And uh, yeah, that was definitely a trial by fire kind of onboarding. But uh, I think it worked out well. And had you worked on anything WebAssembly before um, this rotation? No, not WebAssembly specifically. Um, I actually did a student taught course in college. Um, my college was called Olin um, College of Engineering, great school and very small, like 80 students a year kind of small. And I with a few other students taught a class we called OlinJS, uh, which taught Node and web development and frameworks and all this stuff. So I definitely had some experience, but that was before WebAssembly was really even a thing. Gotcha. So 2019, one year after your Blink on Talk 2018, um, was also a time where we still happily and innocently <laughs> used Twitter. And um, as I said, I reached back into your past and tried to understand a bit where did Thomas come from when it comes to WebAssembly. And um, I found one tweet from uh, 2019 that reads, um, I learned to program 10 years ago, and my programming one teacher in high school still taught through BB6, Visual Basic 6, best program ever. Um, that's you. That's not me who said that. <laughs> um, someone go compile BB6 to Wasm so I can relieve my nostalgia. Um, 
I dug deep and I, I didn't find anyone who had actually compiled VB6, but I did find someone who compiled VB.net. Mm -hmm. And um, they posted it actually a couple of weeks before your tweet. So <laughs> have, you, have you ever used that? Uh, I played with it like a very tiny bit, but no, never really used it. I think the magic of VB6 for me was always that like drawing a button and then like connecting it to some code and just like so seamlessly and effortlessly creating UI and like falling in love with programming. So still haven't seen that, but of course there's many amazing editors of all kinds now on the web as well. So I see, I see. Um, so one other thing that you mentioned in your Blinkon talk is uh, back then WebAssembly super hot topic in blockchains. And um, your talk start, starts with mentioning that um, the Google team had lost two PMs to blockchain startups. <laughs> so is Google working on that? Oh, sorry, <laughs> I won't be getting there. Um, but, but my actual question is, uh, you as the Vasm PM at Google um, in Chrome, actually, um, how do you work with all these teams at Google? Because uh, like we did a talk on WebAssembly at Google, and WebAssembly at Google is way more than just um, Vasm in, uh, in Chrome. It's uh, Vasm in Google Sheets and Vasm in um, what have you, in, in Google Earth and so on. So there's a ton of other, and we will, by the way, a link to the talk if you haven't seen it, um, uh, WebAssembly at Google that we gave in um in Barcelona at Vasmo uh, IO conference, um, actually there's a there's a new iteration coming of this talk in November at VasmCon in um, Salt Lake City. So if you happen to be in the area, um, there's another chance to to catch it live. But like, anyways, um, you working in the Chrome team, um, but also WebAssembly being a not only browser team uh, thing at Google, how does it work for you? Yeah, it's a great question and. I think one of the many amazing things about WebAssembly is that it is so applicable, uh, even outside the web and outside the browser, as just a computational format. Um, there's a running joke on the team that some might have heard that uh, WebAssembly is neither web nor assembly, um, but yet it comes together to definitely also serve that purpose of being an assembly language for the web uh, in some ways. Uh, and it's really great to see that there is so much application of WebAssembly outside the web and outside the browser. And yeah, as you said, blockchain was a really big thing for a little while there. Um, and it's weird to think back now just how like many people were excited and enthusiastic about blockchain as a like computational format and smart contracts. Uh, but WebAssembly is perfect for that, right? As a really tightly secure computational platform that's highly portable and can run basically anywhere. Um, and now, obviously, you see that with the component model and the server-side WebAssembly, and there's a huge flourishing ecosystem. And as product manager for WebAssembly, and you know, including all the folks that are working on standards and, and whatnot, it is definitely a question that I get asked and am responsible for answering of, like, should we go and work on these non-browser kind of use cases? And there is work at Google going on that we interface with. Uh, but for the core Chrome team, we really made the decision that we were going to focus on the web parts of WebAssembly, mostly because everyone else in the ecosystem was doing such a great job nailing every other part of the outside the server uh, or outside the web. And so we really felt like we should be the champions of the web part uh, and keep that going. So that's where we put most of our attention. But we're still really excited to follow and support all the non-web usage of WebAssembly. Is there another Thomas, um, so someone like you, PM on WebAssembly, but maybe embedded in the Google Cloud org? There is like some part timers. I don't think there's anyone like me who's fully dedicated to uh, WebAssembly, but there's certainly uh, folks that are following some of the big efforts. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, so you mentioned um, as a product manager um, buttons, um, you're clicking <laughs> on stuff and UI moving and, and everything. Um, one of the um, questions that always came came up in these early WebAssembly talks mm. is, um, will WebAssembly be able to interface with the DOM? Yeah. And um, another question that always came up is, will WebAssembly replace JavaScript? Yeah. Um, like we know your 2018 kind of uh, answers to those questions, <laughs> but now it's 2024, and I'm I'm wondering today, like, is there is there updates? Um, do you do you want to go back to these questions six years <laughs> after and just tell us, like, what is the uh, Thomas of 2024 take on these questions? <laughs> yeah, it's a really great question. So uh, for the first one of, like, interfacing with the DOM and, you know, JavaScript, 
Uh, even back then, this was obviously possible through bindings, right? So you have your WebAssembly side module, and it's connected through uh, API to the JS side, which can then handle the DOM. And we did hear, and I think even to this day, hear a lot of like, oh, I want to talk to the DOM directly, and isn't this making my app super slow? And we actually did a lot of investigations, and that the bindings part of WebAssembly really isn't the performance slowdown. It's a lot more about uh, type conversions. So if you're passing a string to like um, document, doc get, uh, or whatever, then transforming that string from linear memory into an actual JavaScript string is the slow part. And there are some great optimizations that we've already talked about with strings specifically when it comes to WASMGC that's going to make those bindings even more performant. And we feel like the isolation that WebAssembly gets from not building into itself an assumption about the DOM or JavaScript specifically offers it that great portability that we've already talked about. So no, I don't think you're ever going to see an architecture, this is my personal opinion at least, uh, where the WASM module has some kind of direct access to the DOM, but it's going to be a very thin and very performant and ideally pretty simple bindings layer to do the job for you. Uh, as In terms of a replacement for JavaScript, I think... There could be a road where something like Kotlin or some other language really, really takes off and maybe starts getting more and more and more usage. Uh, but I think that is an extremely long road. And if I was a betting man, I would still keep my bets on JavaScript staying around for a very, very long time. So WebAssembly is as a language that people don't write uh, directly. It's, it's a compilation target. So you would say maybe some... Other programming language language like like Kotlin could take that place, um, but yeah, like yeah. I too think JavaScript will be around for yeah. And I mean, when you time. think of the decades of Stack Overflow questions and amazing frameworks and libraries and optimizations and all this stuff that has been poured into JavaScript over the decades, uh, I think it is going to be a very hard battle. Obviously, Kotlin is still super useful if you have an Android app for shared logic. You know, we can talk more about that as well, and maybe that will be enough of an advantage. But yeah, that's a good segue actually, because um, we wanted to talk about this. So there is um, by now probably also decades of Android development, for example. So people have been investing in Kotlin libraries um, that do things like I don't know, render your charts in your application. And if you're a company and um, you have this amazing charting library and you want to come to the web. Um, a big chance might be to just take this uh, Kotlin library that renders charts and um, bring it to the web and um, yeah, press this magic button that compiles it to WebAssembly and off you go. You have your library from Kotlin on the web. Is this a use case that you see um, like the ecosystem take up? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Generally, uh, yes, I think there is a huge opportunity here with Kotlin multi-platform specifically to enable that shared uh, code logic. And in the past, we've also talked about this distinction between shared UI versus shared business logic. And that is a very meaningful difference because it really isn't a one-click ma magic button, at least with Kotlin. Something like Flutter that's from the ground up multi-platform, it really is that easy to then target WASMGC. Uh, but with Kotlin, if you want to bring that stuff over, it's definitely possible. And we've seen people eagerly do it um, as a significant cost saving and code complexity and platform complexity savings. Uh, but it does require the kind of work to figure out what's the separable piece from your UI, taking that out, abstracting it from the rest of your application, which is a fair bit of manual work, uh, and then bringing that over. But when you compare that to the cost that you've maybe invested in this you know, bit of business logic, a decade or something, uh, you can really get huge savings. And uh, that's what we saw with GoodNotes, for example, so not Kotlin, but Swift. Uh, they took their, you know, like 10 years of work on this really amazing application and brought it, I want to say, in the matter of like a few months uh, to the web, thanks to WebAssembly. So good notes for background. Um, uh, Award-winning uh, iOS application or iPad application, actually, um, that allows people to take notes and like have OCR on it and like do uh, all those amazing things that uh, modern note-keeping applications can do. And um, the team brought the um, the app over to the web so that you can now run good notes on the web. And um, yeah, some of the things that they told us they did was essentially, as you said, separate the business logic out and then have the rendering um, be part of uh, like a classic um, DOM stack. Um, 
I want to go actually into the rendering a bit more because mm -hmm. looking at even the earliest ASM.js applications where they uh, ported some of the uh, KDE applications over to WebAssembly, or uh, like actually ASM.js, as I said, mm -hmm. um, so before, um, but later, of course, also WebAssembly, um, they uh, went for canvas rendering just because, as we said, um, the WebAssembly layer has no direct DOM access. And um, if you have something like uh, a KDE button or a KDE whatever combo box or something, um, it's probably for some use cases easier to just compile that logic um, that is written in C++, I guess, for, for KDE, um, and then just convert it into something that draws pixels onto the screen that has no like semantic meaning to the uh, to the DOM. It's just rendered pixels on a on a on a on a canvas. Um, but like there's also this other approach that we've seen with uh, Kotlin, for example, where they re-implemented sort of the the DOM APIs um, that people know from JavaScript and um sort of one by one ported them over to Kotlin in the concrete case. And um it feels like a bit like, hey, why would someone use this if they could just use JavaScript? Is it is JavaScript just so horrible <laughs> that people don't want to learn it? Or um, but it, like in the, in the end, it makes sense because people can stay within their language that they know and um, yeah. still get a meaningful DOM. But at the other end, um, this this canvas rendering it's a very easy in that sense uh, approach because you just compile the logic that you have already, anyways. Um, like where where's the where's the extreme there? What 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 do you see? What do you see the, the ecosystem tending towards? A really exciting and evolving space right now when it comes to UI, where we do see a lot of these different approaches. So Kotlin, as you said, you know you can use Kotlin to create a DOM in the traditional sense, and it's really very thin wrappers on all these DOM APIs uh, to do that, just so you can do it directly from Kotlin and stay within the Kotlin frame of mind. And then there are all these alternatives that just paint to a canvas. This is what uh, Kotlin Compose multi-platform does, where it takes Compose uh, UI logic and then just renders that to the canvas. And that can be a huge advantage, as you said, because then you can just bring everything over. You don't have to re-implement that UI, even if you get to do it within Kotlin. And a grid of pixels is a universal across basically every platform. And so it's something that really supports your cross-platform capabilities and seamlessness of just having the exact same UI across those platforms. That's also the solution that Flutter is uh, pursuing right now with their canvas-based rendering. And generally, this can be really performant. There are definitely downsides that developers really need to consider, also framework authors. A big one is bundle size. You know, if you are shipping your own uh, rendering system, that's going to be really large. And so it needs to only really be for applications that are willing to take that huge bundle size hit. All right? This is bigger than like frameworks like React and others. Uh, and so that's a big consideration that we also don't have immediate plans to make dramatic improvements on. Um, but then you also need to consider the user agent features that you're losing out on. And these are all the things that the browser interfaces with the DOM for, everything from accessibility being an absolutely critical thing that you need to have and that Canvas apps can have pretty bad, be pretty bad at, but also things like find in page, auto translate, auto fill, all these things that the browser does when interfacing with the DOM. We've seen some folks like Flutter and actually also Pixie.js. They do canvas-based rendering, but then they also do an invisible DOM that they try to position appropriately on top of the canvas just to get those accessibility and other benefits. And we actually have a really exciting uh, API coming out of our 2D graphics team called Place Element and Draw Element. Uh, this is a WASM podcast, so I won't say too much, but it uh, will let you place DOM elements inside of a canvas and actually then render those pixels. And our hope is that it'll give, provide that mix of good performance and cross-platform capabilities, uh, but also bring that back the user agent features. I see. So I looked at uh, the Flutter case a bit and um, documented my findings a couple of months ago. Um, I can link to it in the show notes, of course. Um, but like, I'm also interested in, in your take on um, where where should developers thinking of building an application go today? And um, there's obviously different starting points. You can have an existing application um, written, for example, for iOS, like like the GoodNotes team have, or you could be in a position where you start completely fresh and you might be wanting to bring your application to the web, but then maybe later also to native platforms. So 
As a PM, what <laughs> would you recommend people, developers, uh, do in this case? Oh, man. I think if there's one truth about the web is that it's really dangerous to have some of these very strong opinions about specific <laughs> frameworks and specific uh, web technologies because there are very many options and very many good reasons to use almost all of them. Uh, I think if you have a, if you're starting a new app and you know you want to target multiple platforms, picking a cross-platform framework I think is absolutely essential. I myself in my free time coding project uh, used Flutter and had a really good experience. I have to say, Dart, delightful programming language, and of course it all targets Wasm uh, on the web. So. That's definitely a requirement for me, at least. Uh, but also Kotlin multi-platform, I think, is a great choice. And then even something like Swift Wasm, uh, which enables you to, again, have a cross-platform Swift-based application. Um, I would say for Swift Wasm, that one's probably still in the camp where you're more likely to be motivated by an existing pile of Swift code that you want to run on other platforms, where maybe you've started with iOS already. Uh, but if you're doing like a greenfield kind of thing, I'd probably pick something like Flutter or Kotlin myself. So looking at the Adobe case, what they did, um, they have, of course, have a decades-old um, code base um, that yeah, powers the native uh, Adobe Photoshop app. Um, but they sort of took the, um, I think, the business logic approach, where they took the magic that turns pixels into different pixels, um, like the filtering, the um, whatever, object detection, and so on code. And um, they ported that. But then um, on top of that, they built a classic um, web components-powered uh, um, UI. Um, so I think that's yet another use case there where, um, yeah, essentially you just um, have this, yeah, again, classic business logic separation and um, the UI separation. If you look at Google applications, what do they do? So Google generally pursues the similar strategy to Adobe where you have shared business logic and then uh, per platform UI. And that is very common if you look at something like Google Photos is an example we talked about our, at our Wasm at Google. Uh, talk where they have the editor, for example, for doing photo manipulation, very similar to Photoshop, um, as shared C++ business logic, but then on the platform you recreate that UI. Uh, I do think recreating that UI per platform, obviously more work, uh, but I also think it gives you generally better results and things that feel more at home on the specific platform. That's a good segue, actually, because before you said pixel perfectly the same on each platform, but I was like, wait, um, for Flutter, they have different, um, like, essentially UI language, design languages that they can use. So you can uh, use the Cupertino um, language, you can use the Material Design language, and um, this gives you platform dependent, um, but still based on the same code um, widgets that render differently be uh, based on the platform. And um, I think early Android did the, the um, buttons like for the menus uh, mm -hmm. at the bottom and then, uh, sorry, at the top, and then later they moved to the bottom and so on. So like things that people expect from the, from the platform to just be that way, um, like in iOS applications, you can always swipe back, for example, and you can hold the swipe back button to swipe back several levels and so on. Um, so pixel perfectly the same on each platform becomes, I guess, hard if you want to feel really right on those yeah, platforms. Yeah, that, that is absolutely a consideration. And that's a place where each developer really just, on, even on a case-by-case -case basis, has to make a prioritization decision on whether or not uh, the application should look native, quote-unquote, on each of these platforms and whether they're willing to put in that additional amount of work, which can be extremely substantial. Uh, I think the reason we've seen cases like Photoshop or GoodNotes or all these other you know big apps really succeeding and making big bets on WebAssembly and cross-platform is because there is so much non-UI logic uh, that goes into it, right? Like the rendering system for GoodNotes or for Photoshop, so many decades, so much code, uh, it would be monumental effort to re-implement it. And compared to that, at least, you know, recreating some UI and toolboxes and things like that is pretty minimal amount of effort and lets them feel much more at home. So I do anticipate that that'll be the more common case. But on the topic of um, developers making these decisions about how cross-platform to go, we actually see a pretty interesting trend with a lot of like startups to major large companies where you know if you're a startup and you're just creating your first like application, you'll often choose um, a single platform, maybe iOS or something else just to get started on. And then you'll start to maybe think actually at that point about multi-platform like GoodNotes did when they want to try and hit other platforms. But then there's also a thing that happens where as you get much bigger, you know, and start making maybe ideally a lot of revenue and things like that, you start 
making that choice of putting more effort into each platform. And you'll get platform-specific engineering teams that actually often drop some of these cross-platform solutions. But then the pendulum actually swings back the other way for truly large companies, you know, things on the Google, Amazon, Snapchat, et cetera, scale, where they realize, hey, we have all these different teams. We need to support all these different platforms. And it's like, it's too much and features are out of sync. And like, we need to reduce costs. And they actually then start swinging back to some of these cross-platform solutions, which is what you saw with Snapchat as an example we've talked about before as well. Mm -hmm. So on the complete other end of the um the cycle is uh, games. So games typically have one UI that is nothing native. So games yeah. that would use native uh, UI probably would feel wrong. Yeah. So for games, uh, I think it makes sense to just invent your own UI. But then there's more classic applications like Photoshop is a good example that um, just use pretty boring but pretty productive also uh, user interface elements that people have learned to use over the decades. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think... It makes sense there to just look at what is what is my use case. How much um, freedom do I have um, to also yeah be creative or like how boring do I need to be just <laughs> because my my users expect it that way? Um, I want to talk about um, like the exact opposite of what you said, massive corporations, and the exact opposite of that is uh, startups. And um, what we see a lot recently is um, a lot of startups in the AI space, and mm. they use the web because for them it's the easiest way to showcase their thing that they do with AI. Like, uh, I don't know, it could be audio processing, it could be video processing, it could be text generation, it could be image generation, generation, anything really. And um, for those applications that start on the web where you just want to showcase, hey, this is my amazing new AI startup and we know how to, I don't know, separate out all the cuffings from your uh, <laughs> podcast recording <laughs> recordings or like the, the clearing, clearing of voices or the AMs or anything. So... For those, it's, of course, ideal to start on the web. And um, mm -hmm. what if some of these companies later want to go native? Like, uh, I am amazing audio startup, and um, <laughs> I showcased my use case on the web. But then I realized a lot of the people who do podcasts use iOS uh, application uh, applications um, to actually record those. And um, I need to bring my logic into um, an iOS application. Do you think for those companies, um, WebAssembly is the way to go? Yeah, it's a great question. And there's obviously with AI a big question of whether or not you're running it client side or server side. Generally, we today see dramatically more server side AI running for a lot of these operations, though some of them are starting to be done more client side. And if they're trying to decide, so first, I think the web is so ideal for these startups because it does have that very frictionless experience. You can really just click a link from some marketing or whatever his friend sent you uh, and then get the full experience without having to make that upfront decision to install something major. Uh, I mean, ChatGPT, for example, was a web app before it was anything else. And I think even for a long time was just a web app. And that is a great solution that will also access iOS users, right? Like iOS users were using ChatGPT uh, through Safari directly. Uh, long before they made a native app. And then, yeah, if you do eventually want a native app on Android, there are really great solutions like Trusted Web Activities um, and PWAs for letting you use that web experience directly on Android, which I think, you know, I'm biased, but that would be my suggestion. Uh, on iOS, I think it's more common to having to recreate some UI, though there, there are still some cases where you can use WebView, though that can also be um, disapproved by the uh, App Store policy. Mm -hmm. So something that powers a lot of um, these on-device AI use cases is uh, a library called ONNX. And um, just this morning, actually, I read a blog post from the Spider Monkey team um, that they had optimized their Ion uh, compiler to make ONNX, uh, I think, 70% faster to compile uh, on their Ion, com uh, Ion compiler. So I think that's a really interesting and very exciting use case as well. Um, so you as a PM of WebAssembly, you probably oversee also a lot of the proposals space. And um, can I just, uh, from the AI kind of uh, proposals that are in the WebAssembly area, can you just give us a rundown of what is coming, what's, uh, yeah, what is interesting there? Yeah, um, I know more about the WebAssembly side, obviously, of these proposals. And I am very happy that WebAssembly is going to be supporting our AI vision and strategy more broadly. Um, and the reasons for that is that it is such, you know, a great, very highly performant, portable layer to do your AI functionality on. Uh, obviously, at some point, you're talking to the GPU on the web client side. That's going to be through WebGPU, which is absolutely amazing and purpose-built partly for that. 
And so one project that we are going to be tackling is better WebAssembly and WebGPU interop um, to make that interaction much more performant. And then some other WebAssembly proposals like you asked about, you know, J JSPI, JavaScript Promise Integration, uh, we know is relevant for a lot of these frameworks in order for them to work properly within the web's system. Uh, and then stuff, you know, like WASM64, allowing you to gobble up even more memory uh, is definitely relevant, especially for LLMs to be more capable. And yeah, there's probably some other proposals I'm forgetting about, but those are big ones. Deep, you mentioned FP16. Ah, yes, of course. Uh, some of these additional um, compute extensions that will make WebAssembly uh, workloads run much faster. Yeah, so if you look at um, some of the common AI runtimes, um, like MediaPipe is one of them, um, heavily WebAssembly powered. And um, like a lot of these companies use the same frameworks, like ONNX, like, uh, like MediaPipe and so on. And um, you mentioned it sort of before with the Flutter use case where um, you have Canvas Kit or with the more modern Flutter that is compiled to um, Wasm GC. Um, they have SK Wasm now, so Skia compiled to WebAssembly. So what I'm getting to is uh, you have components that are essentially the same, like uh, the same Wasm file, mm. that you, like the physical file <laughs> that you need for different use cases. Um, but still, all those applications have to download the same exact resources over and over again. Um, do you think there is a way for something like a um, like cross origin cache where you say, "Hey, this is uh, SK Wasm, and a lot of the uh, Flutter applications on the planet will probably use this exact same version"? Um, can we just cache it once and for all, and like, yeah, yeah. make it usable for all the applications that want to use it? Uh, deep sigh. Um, <laughs> this is definitely an area we've looked very heavily at. It's, you know, solving cross origin, uh, resource sharing, and caching. Uh, is something that we have wanted for a very long time. Uh, it, it would enable this like really beautiful vision of the browser where library functionality is loaded and shareable across origins. And you can even have this like very modular sets of functionality and you don't have to worry about the bundle size cost of downloading these things. And we really tried to run this one down. Uh, it was my white whale for a while. And at this point, I'm actually not that optimistic that we'll be able to have something. There's many reasons that we could spend a long time talking about, and I have spent a lot of time talking about, but uh, probably the biggest is version fragmentation, and the second biggest is bundlers. So the problem with version fragmentation is that it sounds great to be able to share these uh, resources across origins, uh, but they need to match the exact same version in order to actually enable that. And so I know when we actually looked at this, we looked at the top 10 most common libraries and resources across the entire corpus of the web, and they were all jQuery, all 10 different versions of jQuery, but not a single version got above 10% of all sites. And so the hit rates are actually relatively small. Then with bundlers, of course, that introduces a whole separate issue because it's all mixed together and morphed oftentimes in some kind of ways. And so there isn't really any way to do that reference. We thought of ways that you know bundlers could integrate with some system to either reference or bundle something. And there are avenues to working around some of these problems, but those are definitely the two biggest ones. Then there's also the monarch making problem is that, you know, pervasive resources that are popular today would continue to be for free. And so new entrants would have a harder time uh, driving adoption in order to get to that point. And a couple of other trailing issues that we've really just gotten pretty stuck on. And um, yeah. So maybe just to take a step back, why do browsers, even in the first place, separate the caching so much? So why why can't you just say, hey, this is uh, the MD5 checksum of this particular resource, and whatever uh, site that wants it can just get it for free? Like, why why don't browsers do that? Yeah, and in some ways they you know kind of did back in the day with CDNs that you could reference um, and then get some of those benefits from cross origin resource sharing. And we moved to what was called double key caching. Now it might be even triple key caching. Um, for privacy reasons. And so there's a timing attack that you can very trivially do where you try to load one of these resources. And since you can also find out which sites these resources are pervasive on, you can pretty quickly build up a picture of the various sites that a user might have visited, which is obviously a privacy uh, problem and something that we improved with double and triple key caching. Makes sense. Um, so as always, bad people is because we can't, or why we can't have nice <laughs> things on the web. 
Um, but yeah, so there's a bunch of uh, things that you mentioned. And uh, as you said, we could go <laughs> deep into any of those. But one thing that I want to go into is the, what do you call it, monarch making or the king making argument. Couldn't we just say um, we run sort of a competition and we look um, neutrally as whatever definition of neutrally goes um, at the most commonly shared resources. So there's uh, resources like the, the Common Crawl uh, project, for example, that have a neutral kind of view of the internet. Um, and we just take whatever top 10% of the VASM files that are out there and just reevaluate every month, year, whatever, um, and then just take those and put it into um, something that the browser could cache and yeah. make available for free. Yeah, um, it is absolutely something we talked about doing and actually even ran an experiment on, uh, we called it cache transparency, uh, where we tried to do some of this like automated detection of these different things. Uh, and it really just runs into um, version fragmentation again, where you end up with no single resource that was so pervasive that it actually ended up not even moving any of our core metrics, uh, like loading performance across the corpus of our users. Makes sense again. Yeah. So um, you mentioned bundlers and um, bundlers munching uh, together mm -hmm. all sorts of things. Um, with WebAssembly so far, this has not been possible. But um, there's a, a proposal called the ES module integration for WebAssembly that would allow you to just import a VASM module um, and then, yeah, just use it. Uh, it would be instantiated immediately. There's a, an additional proposal in TC39 on top of uh, the ESM integration for WebAssembly for source phase imports where you can mm. uh, yeah, import um, a VASM resource but not instantiate it yet. So you can, can uh, pass it an import object, mm -hmm. um, which is sort of a little bit weird because mm. it's not something that we use in uh, ESM um, if they come from JavaScript, but like in WebAssembly, you need um, this sort of feature. Um, and you're pretty excited about uh, this bundle integration. Um, yeah. Can you just tell us why? Yeah, absolutely. I think I touched on this very briefly earlier, but this is really about bringing the powers of WebAssembly to more people than who just want to use them scripted and write C++ code. Anyone who's written a lot of C++ knows it's not the most pleasant experience, and we don't want to turn the web into a bunch of C++ developers. But we all want them to benefit from all these amazing WebAssembly libraries and bits of functionality. And so that means it has to integrate with their existing systems and tools like ESM modules and bundlers. And that is work that we're actually just kicking off like this week. And um, excited to improve that situation. The main goals that we have first and foremost is to enable WebAssembly uh, dead code elimination and module splitting. Mscripten already does this very effectively when you compile from source. It'll remove all the stuff you didn't end up using. But the problem with libraries is that developers who are using Mscripten and doing that painful C++ will finish their library, bundle it all up, something like Skia on, you know, called Canvas Kit or OpenCV, and just throw it all up on NPM or whatever site. And then folks will go and fetch that down. But at that point, you're past the Mscripten compilation step, and there's no real way to like split up the module or take bits or pieces out of it, which is something developers are very used to in the JavaScript ecosystem. Right? You take these big JS uh, libraries off NPM, and then you're able to actually remove automatedly the bits that you don't need. And so we really need to, to enable that for WebAssembly. Still figuring out, you know, is it going to be ES modules? Is it going to be source-based imports? How is it going to work? Which bundlers, et cetera? Uh, but that's all work that's underway, and I think it's going to really help empower a lot of amazing WebAssembly libraries across all web developers. So I looked at it um, from Angular. So Angular have just sort of implemented the developer experience that you will get um, once this lands. So I think right now the proposal is at phase three, if I'm not mistaken. And um, they essentially just have implemented um, this feature where you can just say um, import um, multiply from math.vasm. And um, I was intrigued. So I actually created a little stupid math.vasm that had multiply, subtract, divide by, and so on functions. And I just imported one of them. And um, I was a little bit disappointed because like the developer experience was great. But the thing that was then um, the uh, in the vasm was still the entire math.vasm uh, package. Yeah. So 
um, that code elimination didn't work quite yet. Exactly. So for a band bundler, um, what what is it that they need to do um, in order to make this happen, not just for the developer experience, but also for the actual user experience so that they get less WebAssembly code shipped that the app doesn't even use? Yeah, that is exactly the question that we're trying to figure out. And I don't think there's anything that should be uh, hugely preventing us from doing similar to what they do on the JS side of you know walking the function graph and analyzing the modules, figuring out which parts are actually reached and utilized. And maybe we'll need to integrate with some bits of bundler functionality to also let the developers say like, hey, here are the important entry points into my module and uh, work it through that way. Uh, but yeah, this is all the stuff that we need to figure out. And is the um, objective also to just enable this, uh, what we called before, munching together experience? So you have uh, your master wasm package, and then I can have uh, another master wasm package that is, uh, I don't know, gives me the square root uh, function as well. And um, the bundler would then take those two packages, dead code, eliminate them both, and then munch them together. Yeah, ideally. Uh, that is what we'd like to see, and obviously what we see with the JavaScript ecosystem. And then there's also the hope of doing module splitting as well. Once you've kind of munched it all together, you can take out your critical path stuff from your like lazy loaded uh, stuff and ideally just have all that work as seamlessly as it does with JavaScript today. Amazing. So yeah, we're working together in this uh, at the Google team. There's uh, obviously also standards work happening. Um, I'm also pretty excited about this. Um, I mentioned in several past episodes, um, but yeah, so this is close to the end of this episode, and you know what this means. Um, this means VASM, but not. <laughs> so I hope you had prepared um, in advance some questions or answers for that, actually. So when you, Thomas, instantiate streaming <laughs> on one of your streaming devices, what is it that you actually currently listen to or uh, watch? I mean, uh, the factory must grow. Factorio is and remains a phenomenal game for anyone who hasn't tried it. If you like programming, it's one of those games that tricks you into programming. So that's definitely where too many of my hours have been going these days. I hear people talking about it. Like, Can you summarize what is it actually about? It's really hard to describe, but it's an automation game, a top-down perspective uh, where you mine resources, transform them into various other things. Eventually, you launch a rocket. Uh, but it's really at the heart of it is automation and setting up, you know, self-running systems that interface uh, appropriately with other parts of your self-running systems. Eventually, you launch a rocket. Eventually, you launch a rocket. You start, you know, turning some iron ore into so you some do iron catch plates. it though, like uh, like uh, Elon Musk's company, StarX <laughs> did. Well, I actually, I think even like this week, uh, the expansion of Factorio is dropping, and you're going to space. So you'll actually, I think, be riding the rocket this time to Mars. Let's. I think, yeah, there are planets that you actually visit. So, yeah, maybe Elon's also chipping away at that next week. All right. Sorry, I'm primed by being <laughs> in the valley. And um, I saw my first cyber truck on the streets. <laughs> uh, yeah. it's, an, uh, it's a ridiculous car. But it, really it still kind of is like, yeah. like it turns heads. That's for sure. Yeah. All right. And the final question is, if there is something that you could local get mm. and then global set on the world, um, what would it be? Great question. Um, I think proactive and active appreciation of the modern world comforts and benefits. I think it's so easy to get lost with all the problems of the modern world and all the ways in which we're like, you know, not really meant to live in it from an evolutionary perspective. But it's also just really nice, like a hot shower, going to the grocery store, like riding in a car, you know, getting to places, eating really incredible food compared to what our ancestors had access to. And just, you know, like really stopping at each of those moments, be like, wow, this is really nice. This is just, this is, this is really great that we get to have this. Coincidentally, I, I saw a tweet recently from someone who was just um, admiring modern technology. And um, the tweet was something along the lines of, uh, I just uh, had a phone call with someone who was physically in an airplane and um, it would just work over a voice over IP. And um, they were asking for a recipe, and um, the other person had their tablet and could just copy from the tablet to the computer yeah. um, seamlessly, and um, it would just work. And then the other person on the plane could see the recipe, and um, yeah, pretty amazing. So sometimes yeah. just stepping back and saying like, oh, wow. Yeah, right. Uh, all the technology that we've developed, all even just the simpler things, right? Like 200 years ago, no one had hot showers. Right, and I've had a cold shower once or twice. It's terrible, and I would hate to have to do that every day. <laughs> so that's that's something I remind myself of every time I take a shower, 
And every time I have like a really good meal or something like that, that like, wow, this is this is incredible that we get to have this. And for all the problems of the modern world, a lot of stuff is just really nice. Yeah, being grateful every now and then. Yeah, it's a it's a good uh, yeah, proactive thing gratitude that you could globally set onto the world. <laughs> cool. So we mentioned uh, tweets. We mentioned tweets. If people want to follow the work that you do. Um, Where, the, where can they follow you, LinkedIn? Yeah, I'm not on too much social media, but you can definitely reach out to me on um, Twitter or whatever else. Uh, also, just my email is natastat at google.com. And I'm very happy and eager to talk to passionate people in the ecosystem. So if you have strong opinions about the WebAssembly standard, V8, the supporting Chrome, where we should be taking it, opportunities that we should be tackling, uh, just reach out, you know, and I, I'd love to hear from you directly over email. And your Twitter is uh, no other than Thomas the Dane, right? Uh, yes, I believe so. Because not as that is Danish originally? Mm, yes, I am originally Danish, born and raised. Um, Amazing. Yeah. Cool. So thank you very much for being on the show, Thomas. It was great to have you. And um, yeah, as you know, uh, we worked together very <laughs> for a very, very long time. And um, having you on the show in this sort of different context was... Yeah. A very, very new experience for me because most of my guests that I had so far, I sort of maybe know them from the socials or we, maybe we emailed once or twice, but yeah. with you it was different. So thank you very much for being on the show. And um, if you're listening to this and you do something interesting in the WebAssembly world, definitely also feel free to reach out and um, yeah, just self-nominate yourself. Don't be shy. Um, if you do something interesting, it's probably interesting for more of our listeners and watchers. And with that, thank you very much for being on the show again, Thomas. And for you yeah. for listening and watching this. Yeah. See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.